Let's open our Bibles uh, this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 13. First Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 13, as we continue looking at assurance of salvation, uh, looking more in depth into uh, the doctrine of Christian love, I'll begin reading in verse number 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall, be, I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the, the greatest of these is love. Our text this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 13, which is the Apostle Paul's uh, corrective letter to a wayward church in Corinth in ancient Greece. The first six chapters, Paul addresses some issues that are in the church that have been brought to his attention by others. And then from chapter 7 to the end of the book, Paul addresses the issues that the church itself wrote to him about. Now the reason that the church in Corinth had become wayward and the reason that Paul wrote this letter was because the church of Corinth had become like the culture in which it lived. And ancient Corinth was a wicked city. It was the Las Vegas of, of the ancient world. It was strategically located at the crossroads of commerce and trade in, in the Roman world. So it was very wealthy and it was very culturally diverse. Cosmopolitan population that consisted of Greeks and Romans Near Eastern peoples, a large Jewish population, and a whole lot of travelers passing through the area. And it was a very religious city as well. It was filled with temples to the Greek and Roman gods. But there was one temple that the city was renowned for, and that was the temple of the Greek goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Her temple in Corinth was serviced by over a thousand ritual prostitutes. Corinth was such an immoral place, such a godless place, that even among pagans, Corinth had a reputation for moral corruption. And so the saying was to Corinthianize, which was synonymous with moral depravity in the ancient world. The Apostle Paul lists many of the city's sins that were open and accepted. Fornication, idolatry, adultery, homosexuality, coveting, stealing, drunkenness, crude, and abusive language, violence, all commonplace, all very familiar to modern ears. Now the church in this pagan city, rather than being transformed by the word of God, was being conformed rather to the world. There was in the church division over leadership picking sides, choosing their favorite leaders, pitting them against one another, getting into little cliques over leaders. There was tolerance 
of sexual morality and of a kind not even pagans approved of, and that was that Paul says a man had his father's wife. Believers were also taking each other to court and suing one another. But the church in Corinth didn't really see their sins as a big deal. They just kept on doing church, and they were doing church their way. And Paul calls them to account for doing church their way. They were making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. They were abusing spiritual gifts by lording it over one another. And the abuse of these spiritual gifts resulted in a free-for-all worship. So from the sins that dominated the church to their doctrinal and ecclesiastical errors, the church at Corinth needed correction. And Paul's letter to the first as called 1 Corinthians is that corrective. They truly lost their way. Many churches today find themselves in a similar situation. Carnal, worldly, sinful, unrepentant. And many churches like Corinth, again today, err in their ecclesiology. They overemphasize one spiritual gift over another making that one gift the mark of true salvation, like speaking in tongues. That was, that was what was one of the problems in the church at Corinth that Paul is addressing. And it continues to be a problem in churches today where this one gift is elevated above others, saying we are the haves and you're the have-nots. And like Corinth, churches make the mockery of, of the Lord's Supper. They take this ordinance while they harbor unforgiveness in their hearts for another person. This is what Paul condemned them for because you can't take the Lord's Supper which memorializes the Lord's atoning sacrifice for our sins whereby we are forgiven and then turn around and not forgive somebody else. So we kind of shake hands with the church of Corinth over the centuries because we have become less renewed in our minds by the Word of God and more conformed to the culture in which we live So whether it's unrepentant sin in the church or the tolerance of another person's sins in the church or sins over doctrinal and ecclesiastical error in the church, we can settle the dust here and we can look at one thing that underlies every one of those errors and sins and it's this, a lack of love. That's why Paul's love chapter is sandwiched between his very firm corrective of chapter 12 and chapter 14 when it comes to the church and its exercise of spiritual gifts. Lack of love. It's the same problem in the churches today that have the same problems that Corinth had, a lack of love. And if you recall, love is one of the evidences that we're born again. It's one of the things that we can look to to gain assurance when we are struggling in our faith. And as we said, love is, is not a warm, fuzzy feeling for another person. Love, Christian love, is Christ-like in that it is selfless, self-giving, seeking nothing in return. This is the love that Christ demonstrated. Romans 5.8 says that God shows His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In our text for today, and we're going to break it into two parts, we're going to take a closer look at Christian love in Paul's corrective letter to this wayward, sin-sick church in Corinth. And as I said a while ago, chapter 13 is sandwiched between his disciplined teaching on spiritual gifts in chapter 12 and in chapter 14. If you will recall, this was one of the doctrinal errors in the church at Corinth. You had a group of people who were speaking in tongues and they were lording it over others who didn't. And I think there's a reason why and it's rooted in 
what they used to be before they were saved. Speaking in tongues was a part of pagan idol worship in the Greek and Roman world. Now speaking in tongues, and we'll explore that in just a minute, but speaking in tongues in the Bible was a spiritual gift of the Holy Spirit that enabled someone to speak in an unlearned language so that the person who did speak that language could understand the gospel in their own tongue. That is the gift of tongues in the Bible. Whereas so-called speaking in tongues among the pagan, pagan cults that I mentioned was nothing but ecstatic gibberish and nonsense that was, to supposed, that was supposed to show others that you were in contact with your God. That you had a special inside track with your deity of choice. Knowing that many in the Corinthian church came from this background of pagan idolatry and worship style, you can understand why there was an abuse of this particular gift in the church at Corinth. They were simply falling back to their old ways of doing things which were wrong and hurtful and destructive to the church and the spread of the gospel. So in other words, uh, people in Corinth were from Corinth. And they were pagans. And they worshipped all kinds of pagan idols and gods. And part of their worship was ecstatic utterances, speaking in tongues, claiming that they were in contact with their God. And so when they were saved, and there was a manifestation of tongues in the church, which was known languages, spoken by the unlearned of that language, some folks found it easy to slip back into that old pagan way of practice, and suddenly they elevated this gift again, as they did in their temples, showing that they were super spiritual. So Paul, in chapter 12 and 14, he condemns this kind of stuff, and right in the middle, chapter 13, he says, this is the main thing here. The main thing is love. Let's, in fact, let's look at chapter 12, find verses 27 through 31. This is at the end of, of chapter 12. Paul's corrective on speaking in tongues and spiritual gifts. Notice what he says here. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Well, the answer is no. Verse 30, uh, 31. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will still show you a more excellent way. Paul's not condemning spiritual gifts. He's saying there's an order to these gifts, Desire the higher gifts. We'll see that in just a minute. He said, but beyond that, I want to show you an even better way. And this is where you all in Corinth are, are missing out. What we have here then in these verses, Paul gives the correct biblical order of spiritual gifts in the early church, which are, were to be exercised for the good of the church, for the building up of the body of Christ, not to lord it over others in the church, designating spiritual haves and have-nots. And notice that speaking in tongues comes at the end of the list in verse 28. It's not the main thing. In this list, it's the last thing. In fact, if you want to look at chapter 14, verses 4 and 5, chapter 14, beginning with verse 4, the one who speaks in, tongue, in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies, that is, preaches, who explains the word, builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues. I want you all to be able to communicate the gospel in a language which you haven't learned so that people of that language can hear it. That's very important in the cosmopolitan city. We've got tons of people coming and going from all walks of life and all nations. He says, now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. <coughs> 
to be able to communicate God's word in your own native tongue. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Notice the focus in what Paul is saying here about spiritual gifts. They are others focused, not self-centered exercising of gifts for the benefit of self to show that I'm more spiritual than, than you. Speaking in tongues doesn't make you more spiritual than a person who doesn't. It doesn't make you any closer to Jesus than a person who doesn't. Spiritual gifts themselves don't make you more spiritual. They are gifts given by the Spirit of God to edify other believers, which again means they are others focused. So much of what we see in, in the tongues movement and other manifestations of the so-called manifestations of the Spirit, it's all self-centered focus. It's all me. Look at me. And because they are not others focused, they are selfish. Spiritual gifts are supposed to be others focused, rooted in selflessness and in self-giving. That means they're to be rooted in love, which is the more excellent way. And that takes us back to chapter 13. So, if you're not sure what Christian love looks like, and if, if you're not practicing it because you don't know what it is, then you should be, be able to start seeing what it is. Now, we're really going to uh, jump into this next time, but what I want to uh, finish with uh, in chapter 13, I'm going to look at verses 1, 2, and 3. All right, so we've got the background of what the context of chapter 13, right? It's the abuse of spiritual gifts. It's just one of the problems in the church of Corinth. Just one. And it was speaking in tongues, it was abused, and it was lorded over others. Paul says it's wrong. Gifts are to be used to edify the body. They are to be done in love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, now wouldn't we like to? Especially angels, right? I mean, well, Paul, it, it, he's saying you can be so super spiritual. We'll let the word speak, right? People put a lot of stock in, in the outward show. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Hmm. In other words, you're just making a lot of empty noise. That's what a lot of church services end up being sometimes. It's just a lot of empty noise because there's no love. Verse 2. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, that looks good on your resume. I have prophetic powers. I understand all mysteries and I have all knowledge. And my faith is such is that I can move mountains. The Paul says, if you have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So no matter how super spiritual a person thinks they are, or others think you are, if you have not love, love for God, love for other Christians, then all of your display of spiritual fervor is nothing but a lot of empty noise that draws attention to you. No matter how much biblical knowledge you claim to possess, and boy, we have, we have an educated clergy once again. And there's nothing wrong with seminary training and ministerial training and education. But as somebody said, I can't remember who said it, the difference between preachers today and the preachers back then was that the preachers back then walked with God. 
Preachers today just have education. A lot of guys have PhDs at the end of their name in the church. A lot of doctor, brother, so-and-sos. And that's fine. I'm not, not saying that's wrong. But it doesn't matter how much biblical knowledge you can amass. It doesn't matter how many verses you can memorize and quote. I knew a guy in Bible college who, who, could, who memorized, I think it was the book of Ephesians, and can just sit there and look at you and just go right down the whole thing and tell you uh, the book of Ephesians. But if you don't have love, it doesn't mean a single thing. You can preach like nobody's ever preached. But if you don't have love, you're not saying anything. You may think you're something, others may think you're something, but according to God's Word, if what you know and what you preach and what you believe is not from love and for love, then you are nothing. You are nothing but fooling yourselves and others and you're not fooling God. You may give generously and sacrificially but if you don't have love, you gain nothing. And you gain nothing because what you give away, what you sacrifice, is not for others or for the glory of God, but is just a selfie of yourself doing things in the name of Christ. If you're not doing it for Christ, if you're not doing it for God's people, then you're doing it for somebody. You're doing it for yourself. And what that means is this, is that you're doing it to be seen by others so that you can have their praises. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, 2 and verse 5, and then again verse 16 in that same chapter, that the only reward you will receive are the empty and vain praises of people on this earth. You'll receive nothing from God. See, because the people in Corinth who were abusing the gift of tongues were not doing what they were doing in love. Everything that was wrong in Corinth was because they didn't love each other and they didn't love God. If they had loved God, when they took the Lord's Supper, they would have forgiven other people instead of hanging on to it and bringing judgment upon themselves. If they were operating in love, then they would not lord the gifts over others' heads saying, we're better than you. We're more spiritual than you. We live in a world that promotes self. We're a selfie world. Look at me. Look at what I'm doing. Look how special I am. It's all about me. Christ is countercultural. Christians, it's all about Jesus. It's not about us. It's about what He's done and what He's doing. Christians, we have been given gifts to edify one another in love not to promote ourselves. And for some folks, it's the hardest thing in the world for them to do is to get out of the way of Jesus. It has to be their show. It has to be their way. It has to be all about them. Because they are all they care about. So people look at 1 Corinthians 13 and say, oh, that's that love chapter. That's, that's, that, that's easy to preach. It's easy to talk about. Everybody likes love. But when you begin to unpack what love is, and Paul does that, and that's what we're going to look at next week in verse 8, you find that this love is not this warm feeling. Biblical love 
is the denial of self. And it is doing what we do for somebody else, not for me. And that's the kind of love that gives us assurance that we have been saved. So, no matter what we do in the name of Christ, if it is not selflessly motivated by Christ-like love for God and others, then it's selfishly motivated and has zero value. Zero. If there's no love in what we do, then there is no good in what we do. God is love, and God's people should love God and God's people in the way that God loves us, which was demonstrated by Christ in His atoning death. Therefore, it is a sacrificial love who seeks the benefit of others over oneself. This sets us up for an actual definition of Christ-like love in verses 8 through the end of the chapter in verse 13. This message prepares the way for those details that we'll look at next time. But there is enough in what we've looked at already to convict our hearts for its coldness and lack of love for God and for God's people. Just with a surface understanding that Christian love is to be a selfless love, not a selfish love, there's all kinds of room for conviction in our hearts. Because our natural sinful default is me. And it's a miracle and a work of the Spirit of God when we can decrease so that Christ can increase in us. And so that when we come to church and we see other people, we can look at them and say, it's not about me, it's about Jesus and how I can be helpful to God's people here. Only when we can see that aspect of love can we have assurance that we're saved. Uh, some of us are going to have to wake up and say, what am I doing? I need to love like Jesus loved me. Let's stand together. Father, we come into your presence in the name of Christ. And Lord, we don't profess to understand this love in our being, for it is foreign to us. We are not capable of this kind of love. But Lord, when you set your love on us and saved us, your spirit indwelt us, and now that love is in us. It is not ours, it is yours. And through your spirit, Lord, we love others with the love, the same love with which Christ loves us. So Lord, let us decrease so that you might increase. Let us Speak the truth in love. Let us be love in action towards one another. Let us be forgiving and patient and kind along the way as we are being progressively sanctified in this love. Lord, let us love you and let us love your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 283. Take my life and